Hi, it's Greg Harrell again. I've been talking about using Vim as a email client or using it with an email client. Um, here's the diagram of the rig that I've set up, um, which should potentially scare you away. Because uh, if I compare it to what my email used to look like, uh, you can see there's somewhat of a delta there. Um, so what did my email used to look like? I had Gmail that I basically only accessed via the web uh, or using the iOS inbox client. That was great because uh, it meant my email was exactly the same everywhere and it was easy. Um, I also had work email, which is in an exchange server. Um, I've been using a client called MailMate because it has great filtering. Um, it has some nice you know, Gmail style key bindings as well. It's kind of a power user email client um, and using IMAP for that uh, and obviously SMTP to actually send messages. This rig uh, served me well, just fine for years uh, and you could easily use something like this and be very happy. However, just think of the possibilities if you were to replace it with something like this, you can have a lot of fun. Um, so uh, I'll just walk through this diagram a little bit um, just to give you a sense of how it all fits together. Uh, but basically this top tier here is, you know, what's in the cloud? Like what are we connecting to remotely? This big middle section here is MUT at the core. Um, wow, I'm in the dark, I'm in the dark, I'm in the dark. That's fantastic. I'll, I'll, I'll be back in a sec. <laughs> okay, as I was saying, uh, Mutt is the client. Um, we've got this large constellation of supporting tools around it, um, including Vim, which is the whole reason I'm talking about this. Um, but underneath that is this kind of substrate uh, the, which kind of makes it all work together. Um, everything's running inside Tmux and that's running inside iTerm. Um, I'll explain why that's important. Um, and there's a couple of auxiliary processes that help stick all this stuff together. So let's you know zoom in a little bit here. I'm gonna go through this diagram um, in some more detail. Uh, basically, uh, there are a few different ways we talk to these remote hosts. Uh, we use a program called IMAP filter to run filtering rules on the server. So it knows how to talk the IMAP protocol. You provided some logic written in Lua that I'll link to uh, in the, the show notes. Uh, but basically you provide some logic in Lua uh, that basically says, you know, match these messages in this way and do these operations to them. So I'm just gonna quickly show you one example of that. Oops. Um, actually, maybe the work rules are more interesting. Uh, so let's, have a look at this related, difference related. So basically when I get a code review email, um, there are some things that I uh, wanna do to all messages that are related. So one example might be um, if I take action on a piece of code that's being reviewed, I can assume that any notifications I got prior to my action, I've already seen, because I was just reviewing the code, so I would have seen whatever happened, right? Um, so that's what this rule does. Basically we, look at all messages that come from differential, which is the code review system we use. Um, and if they're from me, we're going to use those messages as a starting point to find all of the related ones. Um, and we're gonna archive them away and mark them as red. So how do we find the related ones? Um, if you look here, basically we look at each message um, and we look at messages that are in reply to the one that my action was in reply to. Um, and all of those messages will effectively be notifications about actions that people took on a code, a piece of code under review. Um, we compare the uh, the dates just to make sure that if there was a, some kind of race and somebody took action like just after I did uh, a review and, you know, before, but before my filtering ran. Um, and so we take all of those and uh, we group them together into a set and those are all the messages that end up getting archived. Um, so that's probably the most sophisticated rule I have, but then I have a bunch of simpler rules and like a good example would be here in my home filtering, just really basic stuff like if I get an email from either of these addresses, then archive it away into the lists folder. So that's kind of typical stuff that you can do in a declarative email client with filtering. Um, but you can additionally do the crazy imperative stuff that I just showed you. So let's get back to our diagram. That's IMAP filter. Um, nice thing about this is it makes the changes directly on the server. So if I then look at the mailbox on my phone, it is going to be filtered, which is nice. Um, MBSync is this tool for 
synchronizing the copy of the email as it exists on these servers with the local state that I have here in my home directory. Um, it's a bi-directional sync. So any changes on the server will get propagated down, but any changes that I make using MUT directly to the mail there will also get um, synchronized up. Um, it's super fast. Um, one of the nice things about the composability of these pieces is that because they're speaking, they each have a single responsibility and they speak kind of standard protocols, you can swap them out. So um, before I used MB Sync, I was actually using a different one called Offline IMAP. Um, and then when I wanted to try MB Sync because I heard it was faster, um, I was able to just swap them and everything continued working, which is really nice. Um, the final piece of like server communication is MSMTP, which is just like a really simple um, MTA for sending email. Uh, basically, all it knows how to do is talk to a remote smart host, so to speak, authenticate and send email. Um, so Mutt will talk to S MSMTP to send email. Uh, so that's the server communication side. Let's look at some of the other sides. What other things does Mutt talk to? Um, it talks to this little query program called LBDBQ, which stands for Little Brothers Database. Um, and this is the query interface to it. Um, this basically allows me to do contact auto completion uh, from this database. Um, the database pulls contacts from my OS 10 contacts application, uh, which is nice because the contacts application has all of my Google contacts in it. Um, it also pulls from the addresses that have previously sent email to me. Um, those addresses are populated by this fetch address tool over here. So basically this tool is gonna to look at the mail there and it's gonna look at recent messages and it is going to populate a database of recent senders. So that's the other data source for LBDBQ. And the final data source is aliases that I've previously defined. Uh, what else does Mutt talk to? It talks to e-links. Uh, e-links is a text-based web browser. So if somebody sends me an HTML email, I can view it in a reasonable way inside Mutt if I want. Um, if it's too hard to read there, I can just open it up in a browser hit by hitting V, um, which I already demonstrated in a previous screencast. Um, URL view serves a similar purpose. If I have an email with a bunch of URLs in it, Mutt can call this to like extract all the URLs. And because it's item, uh, let me go to item and show you a message. Um, let's look at one of these uh, GitHub notifications. Because it's item, I can hit hold command and hit any of these and they'll open the browser. Um, so that's where URL view is useful, but I can also um, use URL view to uh, open using the keyboard. Oops, I did not mean to, to <laughs> I did not mean to reply to this. So let's just go back to where we were. Um, let's open this again. I wanna go to, I don't wanna send a message. I wanna see the URLs. How do I use URL view again? Obviously I've messed up my bindings. I had a binding to show you a list of URLs and you can navigate them with the keyboard and you can uh, get to a web browser that way. So yeah, URL view for opening URLs. Uh, Vim I've already shown for composing and viewing email. Not much for search, haven't shown it yet. Uh, but basically uh, this is an incredibly fast search engine with some cool features. Uh, so I'm gonna, I've totally messed up my bindings. That's terrible. Uh, let's get out of this, get out of this, go back to here, try again. Okay, this works. So this is um, calling not much. So I can do something like subject command T from Greg. Um, and I can search for something like Ruby near compile. And that found nothing, which is cool. So let's try another less complicated search. Um, but that, that found something. That found 44 messages, um, which is cool. So you could basically do searches that are as sophisticated as any Gmail search or even more using like the near syntax um, and some fancy date syntax. Um, and that's super nice. That's very fast. Um, so that, because we have multiple email accounts that are synchronizing at the same time, this not much uh, search index needs to be updated. Um, so it actually updates via this uh, lock run process, which makes sure that even though I have multiple accounts synchronizing, only one of them can kick off a re-indexing process at a time. Um, the reason why that's important is because there's a shared index for all emails. And that's kind of another interesting point. Um, when I moved to this rig, it meant 
um, instead of having personal email and Gmail and work email in uh, MailMate, I suddenly have both accounts, um, as you can see in the sidebar here, both in the same place. So when I search, I find across all accounts, uh, which is actually quite interesting. Um, at the moment, things tend to be reasonably well separated, um, but certainly for stuff that I work on um, at work, because I work on some open source stuff, that's super valuable because I've got all these like GitHub notifications coming to my personal account, but then I've got a lot of internal code review um, going through my work account and I can find all of it at once, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, I think I've mentioned all the pieces on the diagram so far. We get down to this lower level substrate. Um, we have a bunch of glue scripts to hang hold it all together. Um, the fact that it's running in Tmux, as some of you may know, means that uh, some stuff needs to use this reattached to user namespace process in able to be able to interact with the windows like outside of Tmux. Um, one of those processes is terminal notifier. So just say uh, some problem happens with downloading email, I actually want to show a notification to the user. I use terminal notifier for that and I wrap it in um, reattached to new space, reattached to user namespace so that the terminal notifier can actually kind of get out of Tmux and actually connect to the Windows server and show the notification. Um, another piece here is Passage, which is a caching proxy for the macOS keychain, which basically means when this stuff all starts up, uh, I'll get a dialogue to say like, do you want to, do you actually want to allow access to the keychain? I say allow. Um, and then for the duration of the session, I won't have to click it again. But when I close the session, uh, the proxy will go away. Um, and in that way, I don't have to keep my uh, plain text passwords anywhere on the file system. Um, and I don't have to grant overly permissive access that lasts forever either. Um, and so I'm pretty happy with that. Um, and finally, as I said, item, the substrate underlying it all. This is really important uh, that you use item because item knows how to handle URLs. Um, mail to URLs. So if I do a mail to URL to myself, um, first of all, it knows how to recognize it as a URL so I can like option command click on it. But second of all, it knows how to route that back to Mutt. So you see there, it's gonna open Mutt with that email address and I'm ready to compose a mail and send it. Um, so those are the pieces of the system. I'm gonna be back later. Uh, I'm kind of running out of time. I'm gonna be back later and I'm gonna explain or show some of the configuration, uh, but that is how it all fits together. Um, and I hope it's proved useful to you.